<laughs> okay, welcome everyone to Monday's happy hour with Fernway Collective. Um, I am Randall Oliate, founder and president of Fernway Collective. And for anyone who's not familiar with us, we are a humanities educational nonprofit um, focusing on digital education right now during the age of COVID. Um, and so for tonight's happy hour, we have Hannah Irish and Kiesa Hill with us. Um, both are mythologists by degree and profession, I would say. Yeah. And um, I will let them introduce themselves to you. And tonight we're going to talk about mythology. What the heck is a myth? How do we define mythology? Um, spoiler alert, we all define it differently. So good luck with that. And um, what the heck can you do with a degree in the humanities or specifically in mythological studies, right? Um, so Hannah, I will give the mic to you. Hi, I'm Hannah. I am one of the founding board members of Fernway and I'm currently the secretary for the board of directors. I have a master's in mythological studies and I'm working toward my doctorate. And then I have uh, my undergrad in English literature and theater. So I am all about the humanities from a few different perspectives. And in my professional life, I have used my humanities education in a wide variety of practical applications. Um, including social services and program management and product project development, curriculum development, um, the arts, of course, arts programming and production. Um, and uh, our program also has an emphasis in depth psychology. So that also um, plays a part in some of the interpersonal professional work that I'm involved in. <laughs> um, I'm Kiesa Hill, and I uh, as well have a mythological studies with an emphasis in depth psychology masters working on a dissertation. Um, and my undergrad is in folklore and creative writing entitled Myths and the Stories We Tell um, because I went to Redlands. And so I did the Johnston and we contracted um, our undergrad. Um, and I studied a year in Ireland, specifically studying folklore. So um, I am an English teacher. I've been teaching English for 20 years and obviously have used all of those things <laughs> in all of the ways, <laughs> whether it was teaching English um, as we think of English or teaching obviously that connection between English and humanities um, and working on kids, helping them with their writing and finding themselves in their writing, connecting, writing poetry, fiction, um, college applications. Um, <laughs> and then of course, the massive amounts of counseling that you end up doing with high school students um, and trying to make them feel better and more comfortable in their own skin. Um, and that's how I use mine. Awesome. So I use mine in a similar way to Kiesa. I teach at the community college level um, and I teach in an interdisciplinary part department called the humanities. And I know when I was an undergrad and I had this humanities requirement, it was really confusing for me because that was the first time I had ever really heard that word. <clears throat> but humanities is just an umbrella term for all of like arts, literature, basically like what it means to be human. So yeah. art, architecture, psychology, anthropology, archeology, span a lot of the ologies. Um, and mythology <laughs> is also like an interdisciplinary part yeah. of that. Mm -hmm. So before we really dive into what mythology is, I just want to read a couple facts for any people considering a degree in the humanities. I know that it, it can seem a lot safer to get a degree in a STEM related field, but there has been a push over the last 10 years or so to yes. call it STEAM including yes. the arts with science, yes. tech, engineering, and mathematics. Um, mm -hmm. Because even 
y'all, even NASA scientists are well-versed in mythology. Like just look at the names yeah. of our constellations yes. and the planets. Yeah. I mean, mythology is, is everywhere. But before I get on that soapbox, um, according to bachelorsportal.com, uh, over two thirds of humanity's graduates get hired in the private sector. And about 60% of American CEOs have bachelor's degrees in a humanities field. So that's, that's pretty big, 60% of CEOs, right? The mm -hmm. humanities, they teach us empathy and understanding and cultural competency and allow us to find what connects us as humans instead of focusing on our differences. It's, it's looking at these differences and seeing how they're really similarities and how they're really beautiful. And uh, someone stop me before I get too... <laughs> The humanities, so here. <laughs> the humanities teach us how to communicate. They teach us teamwork. Um, they teach us collaborative thinking, right? Like obviously they, we know they teach us critical thinking and problem solving, but they also teach us collaborative thinking and what I think mm -hmm. is a really, really fun um, way in addition to being a really valuable way but that collaborative thinking that you get to do in the humanities is probably one of my favorite things about operating within the humanities well and I think that um that co that collaboration is obviously with each other and thinking about what collaboration is and then within the disciplines and that's so important because um you don't have anything without them working together you know, we need mm -hmm. the math and the science and the technology and the everything. And so otherwise we don't have biomechanical engineering. We don't have, you know, so many other things that really are created because now colleges are moving toward an interdisciplinary moment mm -hmm. that used to be so tough. And when Campbell always said that when he, uh, Joseph Campbell said he couldn't finish his degrees because there didn't have it, it was an interdisciplinary. You could only get the English or you can go only get the whatever. And now that we're kind of creating this whole new space mm -hmm. for these disciplines to work together. And I think we're seeing a whole lot more now science and technology and growth in lots of different areas because of that. I mean, it's like vanilla ice said, right? Stop, collaborate and listen. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> now I'll tell you in addition to your thing, sorry, Randall, but um, just um, on that note about what people are looking for um, and the kind of colleges, um, what they're expanding. And my husband's teaching a class at a junior college right now. Um, and he's teaching the English class, but he's teaching it from an engineering perspective mm. for people who are engineers. So what is good writing look like and what is good communication so that you can get this kind of thing across? And they're actually starting a new uh, anthropology class for the first time called introduction to science technology and society and and several of the uh, ideas are talking about issues in philosophy of science and techno science mm -hmm. and controversy and cultural act science as a cultural activity well and that's yeah. true right i mean ethics plays such a huge part in yes. science and in the stem field overall and where do we get ethics from philosophy philosophy <laughs> right so right. like and and this is something I tell my English students too maybe you're not going to be an English major major maybe you don't want to study comparative literature for your life for your degree but you're going to need to know how to fill out a job application right. how to connect with somebody who's interviewing you how to mm -hmm. write your resume how to how to draft an email because right, yes. like all of this stuff, like this is what you get from the humanities. And this is why you're required to meet these general education requirements in your college yeah. career, because you need all of these skills. Even if you're going to be highly specialized in one field, you still need to know how to communicate, how to connect with people. And like, as far as like MLA formatting and that kind of stuff that I teach, it's all about like, I tell my students, if you show up to a job interview and you're wearing pajamas and your hair is unkempt <laughs> and you stumble in there and you mumble all your answers, it doesn't matter if you're saying the most genius, incredible stuff, it's not going to be received because you're not communicating it effectively. So it's not an either or what you say or how you say it. It's both, right? Yeah. And you have to have mm -hmm. both of those skills. So if you have the skills of 
of the knowledge in the STEM fields, you still have to have interpersonal skills and know how right. to collaborate and work with people and, and, and do your best. Yeah. For my high schoolers, I change, I modify that just slightly and I tell them it's like showing up to prom all jacked out with your fly down. Oh. <laughs> it was like almost there. You look so good. <laughs> Or your work cited pages like the lipstick on your teeth and yes. nobody can pay attention to a single thing you say because it's just distracting them yeah because seriously you just cited cliff's notes what am i supposed to do with that i can't i got nothing i just can't now i can't anybody who needs help with citations or mla formatting please feel free to contact us it is very important a very important piece of your college career <laughs> and I'm happy to help you with it or at least direct you to the resources that you need. It is very important. Wear a nice suit, and it's, wear a nice jacket, wear a nice outfit to that interview. Dress your paper up in its finest so your ideas will be received. Yes. yes. And, it, and it is too easy to do to get points knocked off for not doing it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's just not worth losing it's those points. proving that you can follow directions. That's what your employers want. Can you follow directions? That's what your professors want. That's what your teachers want. Show them that you're listening and that you could put in the bare minimum of effort. Because I'll guarantee you, if you format it right and you cite everything appropriately and you do you pass. all of that, you'll get at least a 70. And what do we yeah. say? C's get degrees. Yeah. <laughs> get it. So uh, again, from having my perspective has changed a lot from being married to a engineer and um, the reality is that if things aren't cited correctly for him and his work because they make rescue hoists for helicopters, mm. that million dollar helicopter will sit on the ground while Katrina is happening and no one can take off because the paperwork hasn't been approved because mm -hmm. things weren't labeled correctly. Evidence isn't in there that this is safe to operate. And so it will sit. So literally for his job, those kinds of citations and knowing how to lay out your paper and how to, which is why he's so good at teaching that class, quite frankly, because knowing how to lay that out can be do or die in a very literal way in his organization. Yeah, that's life or death. Yeah, it is, wow. absolutely. Great, I'm gonna tell my students that now. Learn MLA formatting, it's life or death. It <laughs> that's what I tell my students all the time. And that's I'm like, it's, it up. Even if you get it wrong, right? You can fix that, mm -hmm. but not having it in there at all, you know, in some jobs that is make or break. And in some jobs that could be a million dollar contract. And in some jobs, it could literally be life or death. Yeah. And I think this is a good segue to bring us to something I've been thinking about too. Like we've been talking about the value of a humanities degree within capitalism as your yeah. ability to create income or get a job, <laughs> but humanities degrees are good for the soul too, right? Yeah. Yes. They, yes. they help us like not just on the job, but connect with each other. And I'll admit like, since I started studying mythology, you two have <laughs> seen the, cha the changes in me. Um, I am a lot more in touch with my emotions and my ability to recognize some of my behaviors. And, and I think that comes from studying psychology too, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. we study these things to figure out who we are and what our place in the world is. And guess what? That's what mythology teaches us too. So mythology as an interdisciplinary approach, like mythology is literature, it's art, it's architecture. It's yeah. psychology, music. it's sociology, it's politics, it's history, it's music, it's dance, it's performance, it's theater. Religion. I mean, somebody stop me. Spirituality. It's, it's everything. It's everything. It's Mytholo mythology is all around us all the time. And we have this misconception so often yeah. that mythology is just outdated religions or Greek and Roman gods or Egyptian stories or Norse stories or Indian stories. Like, and we don't. That's not, that, that of course is so much of it, but it's not all of it. We still have mythology alive and well and happening all around us right now. So Anna, would you like to talk about what mythology means to you? Sure. Um, so all three well of us cited, are of in course. the same. 
Oh, of course. <laughs> all, all three of us are in the same program, just to make that explicit. And a big part of us earning our master's was being able to articulate what mytho mythological studies is uh, to us, kind of, you know, our working definition that is that was well researched, um, where we show how we're we're pulling these different perspectives and we're creating our own. And it's so that's just a process. But it's also really fun. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I love I loved that part, getting to articulate all the stuff that was in my brain and that like influenced every paper I wrote, but that I never had to actually verbalize. I was that like, was oh, my introduction, stuff. right there. It was like yeah. I approached <laughs> this question so many times in so many ways. It's really nice to just head on, like yes, this is yeah, yeah. Um, so just kind of with that caveat. So my, like Randall said at the beginning, like we all have different definitions of mythology um, and these definitions, just like myth, at least in my understanding of mythology, mythology is fluid and dynamic and alive. Therefore things change. Um, so my working definition right now is not what it was a year ago and it'll probably be a little bit different in a year from now. Um, I'm gonna read it. Um, so, uh, and I'm lifting this out of a certain draft of my dissertation. Yep, plagiarizing <laughs> myself. All right. Um, while like myth and mythol yeah. <laughs> yes, according to Hannah Irish. <laughs> yes, there you go. While myth, while myth and mythology enjoy a multitude of definitions, I define myth as a story of sacred truth that is illuminated by archetypal and symbolic images and patterns. Therefore, a myth offers an individual and or a community an explanation of its roles in and reasons for existence, and thus provides guiding principles for both individual and communal life. A living myth is a myth that is dynamic and fluid, which grows and changes in response to culture in order to adapt to the needs of communities and individuals. Thus, a mythology or mythos is a collection of such myths. Uh, yep, that's the end, then I move on. So basically for me, mythology um, or a myth is a story that conveys some sort of sacred truth. The story itself doesn't have to be factual in the way that we think of as a true story, um, but it is a truth story. I like that. It's not a true story. It's a truth story. You should put that on a shirt, Hannah. We should put that on a shirt. I like that a lot. <laughs> Fernway should put it on a shirt. We'll there do we it. Go. Crystal, you hear that? You got a new project to do. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. So, so that I think that's a great, that's a great point, right? It doesn't matter if a myth or a story is true or not like verifiable fact. It's about right. what it means to us, how it shapes our worldview, how it shapes the way that we live and function in our everyday life. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's really important too, because I think um, um, we've had an issue with that since obviously arguably Plato, um, that myth means something false and this other kind of verifiable thing means truth but we have these verifiable actions and stories and histories that we operate under all the time and um the reality is it doesn't matter if we agree or if we believe in someone else's belief statement um if they're willing to raise a weapon <laughs> against us if they're operating under certain assumptions that whether we think those are real or not in our world, it doesn't matter if that's how right. they run their country, if that's how they run their wars, if that's how they run their economy, if that's how they run. It doesn't matter anymore if you're under, you know, if that person has that working law or concept. And that's a problem then if we don't study it, if we don't find. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Share that knowledge. Yeah. And it's a lot about transmission of knowledge, right? Yeah. In the stories, in the poems, in the songs, in the dances. Um, 
and that's part of my definition of mythology, right? It's, it's what it means to be human in this time and space and place. Yeah. It's about how we participate in this culture. Um, what are our roles? What's expected of us in these roles? Um, right. And we get that from, from our stories. We know what kind of parent we want to be, what kind of daughter right. we want to be, what kind of citizen we want to be um, from seeing it playing out either, either in a way we agree with in the way that's right, right, right. right a relative term, or a way that we disagree mm-hmm. with and something that doesn't, doesn't conform to our societal expectations. And, yeah. um, and we, we get these from our stories. A, a super easy example is Little Red Riding Hood, right? Yes all of these lessons that we get from this folk tale that aren't spelled out to us, but we're able to connect with the protagonist and get into her shoes. And so we know right. she got herself in this situation with the wolf, not to victim blame little red, but <laughs> did she listen to instructions, right? The instructions were stay on the path. Don't talk to strangers, listen to your parents, finish your task, go right. there to help your grandmother. Don't get distracted picking flowers in a field like Persephone, but that's a whole other conversation. (laughs) Or a similar Um, one. (laughs) Yeah, similar one, right? But we learn all of these lessons through the stories that we, that we hear. Um, So Jess, what, what's your definition of myth and how is that different from a folk tale or from folklore in general? Um, so I was just going to say that Little Red Riding Hood is an excellent example um, because, again, with folklore, what we're talking about um, are ways that we hand ideas down, concepts down, and use those as teaching tales to our communities and to our um, children. There's kind of four basic uh, rules when it comes to folklore. Um, one is it teaches you um, where you come from. Two is it teaches you what the rules are of your society that you're in. Um, Three is it teaches you um, what happens to you if you disobey those rules. And four, it has to be entertaining. And that's the kind of broad working definition of folklore itself. Um, And so again, like mythology, so many things are folklore. They're part of our folklore. When I teach it to my students, just even their student desks. They tell a story about how we view education in America. Mm. They're cheap. <laughs> they're, they're easy to put in straight lines. They're difficult to put in partnerships or groups or circles. Um, mm. They are plastic coated so that they're easy to clean, but they look like wood. So that they're trying to give it the ambiance of some kind of authenticity it doesn't have. Um, their lovers, the ones that I have in my classroom, they don't have any forward um, um, forward um, legs. So you can literally push on it with one finger and they'll fall over, but it was cheaper that way. Um, and, so, and so what do we really think about education in America just using this one item? Um, it tells us a lot, again, like I said, where we come from, that it's a factory kind of situation. Mm-hmm. It tells us the rules. You have to stay in straight lines and you have to respond only when spoken to. Um, it tells you what happens if you break the rules, right? You're no longer allowed in the chair and it no longer allowed in the chair, of course, really means that you're no longer allowed as part of this culture, this group, this society, this education, getting it's a like job. A group of students. And then the kind of entertaining is, does it meet that use? right? Are people going to use it over and over again? Because it's effective. Um, So entertaining doesn't necessarily mean ha ha, um, but it means that we keep choosing it, that it's meeting some kind of need that we keep choosing over and over again. Little Red Riding Hood does the same thing. And obviously, if you're doing strict folklore, we're going to talk more about story and, and stuff. But so even in these very little ways, we hand down, not just knowledge, but um, culture and the pressure to perform in a certain way, be a certain kind of person in that culture. Um, So again, Little Red Riding Hood is really all about um, who gets a say in in choice, right? Who you're allowed to talk to, how you're allowed to act, what you're allowed to eat or drink, right? Who's gonna respond? The older Little Red Riding Hoods, no one came to rescue her. Um, And that's of course the story I told my own children. 
because it's there's such a dissonance and here's where cognitive dissonance i think is a real problem because we t the little red riding hood story is a story of safety and um trying to and help kids understand that the world is dangerous and that you don't talk to strangers um, and that you listen to family members, right? And the older Little Red Riding Hood, no one rescues her. She doesn't get cut out of a stomach or anything like that. She dies because the reality is there wasn't anyone to rescue you. Who in the middle ages is gonna come rescue yeah. you? There's no standing police force, right? Unless you go to clan days where you might have a whole family group come after you. Um, but even then that was limited. So. Not until we watch real police forces come in do we watch the story change. And so I think what's beautiful about folklore is we're literally watching, you can predict this change in culture by the direction the story is taking hmm. and the things that are then changing. So I find like comic books, which are in a sense our modern folklore, um, yeah. really, really fascinating because notice that we had civil war before we had civil war. Mm -hmm. it completely mm -hmm. predicted the issues in the election and with the place that America was standing in and then I think it also gives it a place to um gives it a place to discuss those issues and then in a sense it brings those tensions to the front right where we're paying attention well um, then it's that question right does life imitate art or does art imitate life and being a folklorist I'd say it's co it codependent you know Both, right yeah it's mm -hmm. yeah, codependent Cir circular it's well like it's like checking your oil right the oil said that your car is gonna die <laughs> and look at that it did like <laughs> it's it goes <laughs> it goes together um but what I was gonna say like with my daughter and my kids you know and that folklore changing I, it, it's really interesting and we have to be careful about how we how we allow it to we're the ones in charge of it like you said, um, Hannah, like it's constantly changing. And so I'm gonna tell my daughter the story where she doesn't get rescued because the reality is you might not. I need you to know it's, it's a story is the easiest way to tell a child, you know, how to be a healthy human. And then I don't make her hug her grandparents if she doesn't want to. You know, she only saw them once a year and she didn't remember them then I'm not going to make her hug her grandparents. And I'm not going to have her take a, a sticker from the lady at um, the farmer's market or at, it always drove me crazy. Like, don't, don't give my kids, they don't know you. And I just taught them not to talk to strangers. Don't give my kids a yeah. lollipop at the grocery store. Mm. You know, that's completely cognitively dissonant to what it, I'm teaching my child. <laughs> Yeah. So I, th I think that stories do a good job, but I think that, um, again, like you said, Hannah, they, um, we have to be aware of where maybe yeah. our, our stories are, should be, or are our real truth, but then in our lived experience, we don't measure up. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that something so you're talking, you know, about kind of the, the teaching aspect of storytelling. I would love to bring into the room the idea, um, and Kessa, you may actually have mentioned this at the very, very beginning when you're talking about your undergrad, um, but the transformative power of story, yeah. right? Like story as transformation, and that can happen on an individual level, and it can happen on a community level. Yeah. And um one other working definition for me, especially in this kind of conversation, you know, I define community as basically any group of people, right? Yeah. So that can be a, a partnered couple, that can be a nuclear family unit, that can be an extended family unit, that can be a town, that can be um, a spiritual or religious congregation, that can be a government at, you know, any level, city, state, federal, whatever. Um, and so again, like you can see if you look at different community movements and moments of change in communities, you can always find where storytelling plays a part right. and story is used 
both to affirm certain things, right? We definitely, we, we see stories in all sorts of times and cultures that are used to affirm the status quo, yeah. to encourage us to, you know, follow the rules and to perform the role that we have been given. Um, and then you see those stories that are told specifically to push back against something. The, the kind of the what if stories, like what if this story was how things actually are? Um, and that it gets, it gets at you in a very different way than, you know, an informational pamphlet or a lecture, right? Because it connects with your emotions. Um, you, you know, it taps into your empathy. Um, and I, I mean, that's one of my favorite things about story. So is, is that transformational piece? So two things, one that, f that fed right into my definition, working definition mythology, <laughs> but two, that, what we were talking about earlier before we went live was, um, yeah. one of the quotes that I always tell my students that turns out Aristotle said first, um, <laughs> to cite it, Aristotle's metaphysics, um, <laughs> is that storytelling and is better history than history and science than science. Ooh. Because through storytelling, we practice our judgments. So we not only walk through someone else's shoes, but we practice what could happen. What would happen if, right? And we use that yeah. imaginal space to really think about, look at Frankenstein. At the time Shelley wrote Frankenstein, they were just putting um, circuits on frogs and making them jump. But now look at who we are. So the very real question of how much biomedical engineering do we do? How much is too much? When do you want to be the person then in the room that has to decide to pull the plug or help? I had to help my grandmother sign her DNR and nobody else would sit with her to sign it. And um, it was, you know, obviously ridiculously terrible, but the other options were worse of what they're going to do to my 95 year old grandmother mm -hmm. to keep her alive that were really inhumane. Mm -hmm. So um, those questions that, you know, Shelly asked us we're having to face today, but it gave us kind of that mental, you know, almost a hundred year head start to really think about what are we gonna do? Like, how do we feel about this? Where is this going, you know? And so, yeah, story gives us that opportunity and I think it's worth mentioning the subtitle to Frankenstein if people are unfamiliar with it, right? It's the modern Prometheus. Yes. And so that's that like Shelley literally wrote this novel on the cusp of scientific advancement on the back of a piece of mythology, a piece of yes. classical Greek mythology. Um, and so it's it's really hard to to separate those things. Gosh, I guess Aristotle Aristotle was a pretty smart dude. Right? Who knew? <laughs> yeah. So I know, like, in, in Aristotle defines like mythos as plot and says it's largely responsible for building the foundation of the model of rational thought that we can still see in our society today, like in modern times. And so, like, it's it, it's kind of getting away from the sacred and mysterious nature of being and replacing it with reality that can be measured and observed with the senses and categorizing. Um, and, and to Aristotle, right, reality equaled truth and reality is only that which can be clearly seen and measured. So then how does myth fit into that as such an important piece of us? Um, so to speak to that, the interesting thing is, because that's what I've been looking into, um, because I was conflating um, some of the Arist Aristotelian views and, um, and the Neoplatonists, and that turns out that's not weird, that's what people were doing. Um, so I've really had to tease some of those things apart. What's interesting thing is that um, Plato, for all his, you know, anti-myth, in a sense, creates this whole new myth with the dualism and the forms and everything. And he relies on myth to explain it. And then of course, like I said, creates his own myth um, to, to get this story across um, or philosophy across. 
Aristotle for all his senses, it's very much, um, again, this story allows you to practice into the space and to feel in your senses in a very real way, um, something you wouldn't have otherwise been able to feel. So a travel dialogue or to understand a concept, a story will allow you to feel into that space with your senses and essentially bring in, come into an imaginal space where you're all having a dialogue together across centuries and concepts in a way that Plato doesn't believe because Plato is gonna do the opposite. He's gonna say, story is just there to confuse you because that's not the real form of anything. It's lower than a real form of something because now you're just reporting on something that maybe is real, maybe it isn't, maybe someone made it up, maybe it's a just imagined kind of thing. Whereas Aristotle's gonna elevate that and go the only way to know something you don't have access to and to bring that into your sensory place is to put it in a poem, into a play, into music. Mm -hmm. Because now, I mean, think about a song, right? everyone experiences and yeah different directors will do different but everybody can come into the space and listen to this piece and have an epiphany have an awakening and have that shared experience exactly and right. that for aristotle wanna... is it that experience yeah a shared trip if you will right? <laughs> which for him becomes a shared real lived experience and so that becomes mm -hmm. real Right. Yeah. That realness is important to him. Right. And like how tangible are those feelings? Cause like when you're talking about this, I'm specifically thinking of like the energy at live concerts yes. or live yes. theater. Yes. And it's so different. I mean, that's a religious experience in itself, yes. right? You've got the band mm -hmm. elevated up on stage, <laughs> proclaiming their message to the masses who are having overwhelming emotional reactions to it. I mean, the closest thing. <laughs> All right admission time i've had a couple beers now here we go happy hour the closest thing i feel like i've had to a religious experience is when i saw neil young live the sun was setting he was singing and playing and just like yeah a single tear just fell down my face because the energy of the crowd that he was giving and like the the symbiotic relationship yeah right that like he as a musician wouldn't be in this place without us the crowd but we wouldn't be there without him and the push and pull of all the energies yeah. that we were all exchanging now i'm sounding like a total hippie um but it was it was a mythologist <laughs> I'll take it. it was ma it was it was pure magic and that was yeah. like the best concert i have ever been to hands down and it just it felt like i was I was one of many in the best way. Not that I was nameless and faceless in the crowd, but that I was plugged into something higher and bigger than myself. And I was part of it. Yeah. And as that's a the, largely non-religious person, yeah. yeah, I think that's a, a lot the of communitas. these yeah, religious experiences that people talk mm -hmm. about um, that yep. I get through classic rock, which is fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in okay, COVID so times, it's been hard to have those community experiences. Yes, for real. Um, okay, Kiesa, I really want to hear your working definition of mythology. Oh, yeah. um, okay, so I'm going to go, since you read, I'm going to read mine too. Um, this yeah, is a section of it, but I'm just going to simplify. So I hope that it, um, I can pull out one paragraph and it won't get confusing. But I think in the context of whatever else we've discussed, it'll be okay. Uh, myth mythological studies uh, is fundamental to what is real, what is known, what is truth, what is life, and what is soul. It may be the study of traditions, art, religions, and stories of past and present that link us to the navel of civilization and to ourselves, but even in that list, it is more than that too. Heraclitus reminds us that you could not discover the limits of the soul or psyche, even if you traveled every road to do so, such as the depth of the meaning of logos. While we venture into our daily lives, stories and rituals offer us a clue to find our way through the modern maze of our lives and to the center of ourself. Mythological studies is a way of picking up these clues in literature, archeology, span art, etc. As, as the maze is unknowable, 
We can only feel our way through using these threads of stories woven and rewoven in this mythological method to connect our past, our present, our minds to matter. Um, that only happens through the languaging, and here's what's really important to me, the languaging of ideas and questions. Um, Kassir says the original bond between the linguistic and the mytho-religious consciousness is primarily expressed in the fact that all verbal structures appear also as mythological entities endowed with certain mythological powers, um, that the word, capital, in fact becomes some sort of primary force in which all being and doing originate. So mythological studies is a study of how then mythologically, mytholo mythology, sorry, in its highest sense is the power exercised by language on thought in every possible sphere of mental activity. Um, quoting Max Muller there at the end. Um, in a broad sense, there is no other study. Everything has its place in mythological studies. After all, what is business but an attempt to put in language and mathematics what is clearly faith in a certain company, faith in the economy or belief in the stock market. Um, what other studies often fail to do is acknowledge their own mythological basis or connections, their own cultural, storied, imaginal places in the world. Um, this is what Plato was able to hold in his head that we have often forgotten. That not only can we, but we constantly do, can we, but we constantly do hold both factional and imaginal truths in our head at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, the study of mythology is not only the study of various pieces culture creates to communicate truth, but to study the cultural context and its effective, uh, its effect on us. Because whether we believe in a myth or not, the process of languaging it makes it truth. That's my working definition. <laughs> nice. I love that. Randall, what it, did you give yours? I mean, no, I feel like you gave some like, of it in. Pieces. It's a little, yeah. Is yeah there anything else that you want to add? It's a little different. So in, a, in my classes, like I, of course, talk about ancient myths and religious myths, but we also have secular American myths. So mm -hmm. in our oh, society yeah. today, we've got this clear separation between our sacred life and our profane life, right? Our sacred and mm -hmm. profane spaces. Um, but it wasn't always so. And so that's why okay. we kind of have this misconception about ancient societies that like it's a joke in the archaeological community that if you don't understand, like if you find an artifact and you don't know what it is, you just say it was used for religious or ceremonial purposes. And that's kind of like the catch all term. Right? I mean, you can't, you can't that's understand awful. everything. Like when no, that's, you're talking yes. about material folklore, right? All of mm -hmm. those like symbolic, like all that symbolic analysis that you put onto those desks. Right. wouldn't exist if an archaeologist found those a thousand years from now they would have right. no idea how to interpret that and we talk about material culture and archaeology as well um and there's a book i believe it's called in small things remembered um talking about like our material culture that we leave and i think that's such a big part of mythology that so much of what we do in our everyday life we don't know where it comes from our wedding traditions our little rites and rituals that we have mm -hmm like just as we go in our day-to-day -day lives. Like the easiest example is we all have, if you have a car, you, have, you probably have a cup holder in it, right? Except my first mm -hmm. car, 1987 Volkswagen Rabbit, no cup holders. But <laughs> if you have a cup holder, it's a specific size. And then we have, oh, I don't have a cup with me. We have those cups that are large on the top and small on the bottom, right? So they fit in the cup mm -hmm. holder, like a 7-Eleven mm -hmm. Big Gulp cup or whatever. Mm -hmm. But what if an archaeologist found that a thousand years from now, that cup, what could they say about it? They could say, oh, this must be a society that really revered their gods and understood that the humans were small on the bottom and the gods were larger <laughs> on top. And we see this in their ceremonial chalice of the big gulp, right? Like, this is how ridiculous a lot of archaeological theories are with material culture we find because we have no idea. 
we're taking our best guess based on modern understanding. So Hannah and Kiesa or anybody watching, do you know why our cup holders are one size in our car and why we're now making drinks to fit that standard size? It's because it's the size of a soda can. I mean, this is a beer can, but you know, when those sizes were standardized, they didn't have as many open container laws in the States that we need to. <laughs> so yeah, we have here two different cans, regulation size yes. aluminum cans. That's what our cup holders are based on. And now we have other cups that are made to that standard to make right. sure they fit in cup holders. And we want to have our cups have bigger volume. Well, now they're bigger on top and still small on the bottom, which like doesn't make engineering sense, right? It should be no, they're top heavy, and stable they're... on bottom <laughs> and yeah. smaller on top. But we're basically retrofitting our beverage containers to fit the standard of our cup holders that only exist because our old beverage containers were a specific size. So this is something that most of us use every single day that we have no idea why it is the way it is. So mythology gives us a lot of those answers, even if it's in like a symbolic form or a more like imaginal space. Um, and so my background is in archaeology where we're taking like actual physical material culture, but we have to assign meaning to it oftentimes with like in societies that didn't leave any written records. Mm -hmm. And so how do we guess what the meaning is? Um, so mythology yeah. to me is all of the stories that make us human. Mm -hmm. Everything, like I said, that, that, that teaches us how to be, that shapes how we see the world. And when I talk about things like secular mythology, secular mythology is stuff like the American dream, mm -hmm. like any narrative that we have. And so for me, the difference between mythology and a folktale is folktales, in my opinion, are like grassroots stories, right? They come from the everyday person, right? A folk tale, tales of the people. They're not coming, they're not being passed down to us from organizing systems of power, structures of power. They're coming from a person to person level. And folklore is everything from the stories that we know and love, like Little Red Riding Hood, to recipes and hand games and jump rope rhymes and yes. how to organize your kitchen. And the graffiti. And graffiti. Yeah. Like Ooh, everything that is like of the people mm -hmm. and mythology is all of that. Plus a lot of political campaigns right. and um, propaganda, right? It mm -hmm. teaches us who we are, what our place is in the world, where we belong and how to function. Every myth does that. So that could be religious in nature or it could be secular in nature, right? We have the mythology of the American dream that teaches us if you go to college, you pay your dues, you can get a good job and you can be successful in this life. Is that necessarily true? Not really. I would argue that we're working on a system of outdated mythology because the people who are in power making decisions for our country were operating under that mythology when it was true, right? When that actually was how the world worked. Um, and we still have these narratives put on to us, but they're kind of conflicting. So we're like definitely in this transition yes. in this country, in America, yes. with our outdated mythological systems that are no longer yes. serving us the way that we would want them to. And that's the thing with mythology. It morphs and it changes based on who's telling the story, who's receiving the story, and what like the cultural zeitgeist of the moment is. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so... That's, that's something that I think we really need to keep in mind, like student loan debt and the American dream. The American dream, sure, was the reality for white suburban families in the 1950s, heteronormative nuclear families where the dad could go off to work, uh, the Cleaver family, right? right? Mr. Cleaver could go to work, June Cleaver could stay at home, keep house, have two and a half kids, a white picket fence, own a car, and maybe do a few things for fun. And this could all be on a single income of somebody who didn't go to college, doesn't have any student loan debt, and is flipping burgers for a living. That is no longer the reality in the United States of America. This is 
outdated mythology that definitely served a purpose at one time. But now we have, right, our policymakers who did live in this reality, who don't understand what the current reality is. And so they're still spreading these stories. And that's not to say that myth is equated with falsehood. It's just, that's not, that's no longer our worldview, right? Right. Now we need new mythology to replace Yes. this outdated secular American mythology. So we also have, like, we have our community mythology, whether it's our, our folk group of our classroom, right? Or of women in America, white women in America, Californians, however we like define that folk group. And then we also have smaller mythology, like our personal mythology. Who do we see ourselves to be? Where do we think we fit in this larger narrative framework? And then our family mythology. Do you come from a family of medical doctors and you decide to go to school to be a doctor in mythological studies? How does that work, right? Like, what are those expectations and who does your family, like, where's that role? And I think it's all about like roles and who we're supposed to be in society. Our society tells us one thing, maybe our teachers tell us another thing. Our family tells us maybe something different. And then how do we see ourselves? Hopefully we all see ourselves as a protagonist, right? Not as the sidekick or the quirky neighbor. But um, mm -hmm. there's, I, I'm, I'm like so passionate about contemporary secular American mythology because it's happening all around us. It's in the stories we tell. It's in the advertising that we see. Yes. Right? Like we have an idea of what the world is, who we are, what our place in it is as U.S. Americans and we get that from the stories that are told. Yes. So that's well, and I think something I think something to keep in mind too. And I don't know who first said this, but it's not my original idea. I will say that much. Um, <laughs> right. But the idea that there's nothing new under the sun. And so there's a reason why these myths and these folklores and these fairy tales and these legends from hundreds, thousands of years mm -hmm. ago still matter to us, right? We're not reading them. We're not talking about them. We're not interpreting them um, because they don't connect with us on some level. We're doing all of that because on some level, we're like, this is still true. There's mm -hmm. something about this story that is still true, even though the world I live in looks nothing like the world that this story right. came out of. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, Randall, when you're talking about some of these outdated American myths and how we need some new ones, um, it's, it's not necessarily a bad idea to kind of look at what are the, what are the older myths and the folklores and the fairy tales that are popping up in art and media right now? Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of reflect on like, okay, so people are people are feeling these stories. There's something resonating about these stories because they're coming back. They're coming back into this cultural consciousness that we share. And what can we learn from them? Mm -hmm. You know, how can we, how can we engage these old stories um, to help us create the new stories that we need to help us, you know, move forward in culture, in our individual lives, um, you know, whatever it is. Um, so I just like, again, yeah, right. There's that, that circular, yeah, that circular mm -hmm. relationship. Well, and I think that's, that's the beauty of oral mythology, right? Is it's like I said, it's, it's like a game of telephone and you can, it, the, the stories have the same bones, but like with little red riding hood, it, all the details are fleshed out according to what that society needs, what they value, what they what they hold important to them. Does Little Red get saved at the end? Is it a learning experience or is it the end of the road for her? Like who comes to save her? Does she save herself of her own volition by cutting herself out of the wolf's stomach? Does the right. woodsman come to help her? Like where where is it at? Um, and so it is, and, and I do this with my classes when we're in person, we play a game of telephone and I start it and then we see how it changed at the end. And that's why we have so many different versions of these stories because 
Mm -hmm. everybody brings their own perspective to it, right? We all have our own point of view, our own individual schemas. And what do we, what are the important parts that we as individuals pick up from the story? And then how do we communicate that? And then how is it received by the next generation? Um, And that's, that's what's so hard now is that we write everything down and it becomes stagnant and permanent Mm -hmm. instead Mm -hmm. of this like ebb and flow of what the culture needs, like, and the story's changing based Mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. cool so this was really wonderful thank you both so much for for hopping on this um I mean gosh it feels like this hour just flew by I could talk about this literally (laughs) I know and I know we've done it before (laughs) (laughs) um but let us know in the comments if you're interested in hearing a little bit more about mythology I feel like we barely scratched the surface I mean like I do a whole semester of this stuff with my students and it's still not enough. We're in a whole PhD program and I feel like it's still not (laughs) enough. Um, I mean, we could talk for hours about archetypes and psychological complexes and the collective unconscious and literally all of the things. So if there's anything, if you have any questions about mythology, if you'd like to hear about a certain mythological figure, a certain tradition, a story, um, really anything you want to hear more about secular mythology rituals storytelling archaeology um we have great resources and great connections with professionals all across the humanities in so many different disciplines um and we would love to hear what you think and and what you're interested what you're interested in and kiesa thank you so much for joining us Thank if you, you happen to be someone who's really interested in a working definition of mythology, Joseph Campbell's book, Thou Art That, is a very fun exploration of how mythology is still relevant, how it's dynamic, how it intersects with art um, and things like that. So, and it's a very, very like quick, accessible read. Yeah. And for those who aren't familiar, Joseph Campbell is like the person who brought mythological studies to, I mean, I want to say the forefront of academia, but you know, legitimized it as an actual. Yeah. 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 Comparative mythology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, So thank you so much, everyone. I love y'all. Yeah. Yeah, I love you.